Um, I would like to introduce uh, Carolyn Carlin from my office, uh, the Office of Compliance. She's a compliance officer in my division. She handles all the flammable fabric stuff, specifically sleepwear and general wearing apparel. And she has been the main reason we've been having a lot of recalls because she's out there. She's a sleuth on the internet. <laughs> and she finds products and brings them in and we test them and she loves to do the recall. So that's Carolyn Carlin. And then next to Carolyn is Paige Whitson. And Paige is a textile technologist at the laboratory. And she is the person doing all the testing. So um, I'm going to turn the podium over to them and they're going to bring you up in technology and we're going to play, uh, have some fun. Sorry, not play a game. Okay. All right, so before we start with this interactive PowerPoint slide, there's a lot, thank you, this fall. Um, I wanted to reach out and just mention um, Jonathan's email. Um, we have an email guy up here who is able to keep a listing of all the FAQs. So if there's any questions that you don't raise a hand or you don't want to say out loud, um, you can just email him at J-K-E-N-T, is that right? Okay, at cpsc.gov. All right. So being the millennials we are, we wanted something fun and active. Um, <laughs> I'm going to just state that the questions can be tricky, but you all should know the right answer, right? <laughs> yeah? Okay. Well, Paige is going to explain the process, but you are going to need a cell phone. Everyone has one of those, right? <laughs> um, all right. So there is an email sent out last night to people who registered online, and also in your uh, folders, there is the address to type in to ask, access the questions. Um, for this section, so if you want to pull that out, either get it through email or type it in from the, your handout in your folder, that would be great. We can get started. Right. Wanna... Majority good to go or anyone having technical issues? We're going to go with the first question. All right. So which you want to move over a little bit? Yeah. Which can... garment is considered sleepwear? Ooh. There's also a video in the back for those. Yeah, there you go. You got it. All right. So garment 1 is a 100% cotton woven two-piece set that is paired with a diaper bloomer. The fabric weighs about 5 ounces per square yard. Garment number two is a 100% woven garment with lettuce-like edge trimming and a pink ribbon at the neckline. neckline. The fabric is a lighter weight. Which one is considered to be sleepwear? Or we can, or we can just wait and see what people... Has everyone voted? <laughs> All right. So now the correct answer <coughs> is garment number two. Garment number two. Yes, garment yep. number two. All right. This is known as a traditional sleepwear nightgown. Question number two. Which garment silhouette appears to be traditional sleepwear? Garment number one has buttons and a Peter Pan collar. It also has piping around the wrist and the ankle. Garment number two is 100% cotton. Oh. Oh, so people aren't back. Yeah. <laughs> I just got to keep it up for the webinar. I think that. The answer is number one. Traditional sleepwear is loose-fitting sleepwear. The second garment is considered to be tight-fitting sleepwear. 
Next question, which garment appears to be tight fitting? Garment one has lettuce edging trimming with a ribbon at the top, the neckline. And garment number two has rib knit. <laughs> All right, I'll stop talking. <laughs> All right. Yes. The answer is, is number two. Yep. All right. Can tight-fitting children's sleepwear garments have a hood? <laughs> right. No, it cannot. <laughs> tight fitting garments cannot have any type of trim, embellishment, or decor that is more than one fourth of an inch from the point of attachment. And a hood is a good eight inches, nine inches, maybe even a foot. Next question What type of children's sleepwear requires a hang tag? Okay. All right. <laughs> Answer is tight fitting garments. Tight fitting garments are required to have a garment hang tag. It is the yellow safety hang tag that you see a lot in the stores. Is an FPU or GPU number required on traditionally styled children's sleepwear garments? Bless you. There's yes, they do require um, a FPU or a GPU number on s traditional sleepwear. Both aren't required as long as you have one. Normally this is printed on the side seam label inside the garment. Are there mandatory labeling requirements for children's sleepwear? Yes, there are. There are mandatory labeling requirements. This should yeah. have been first. Yeah. <laughs> but yes, tight fitting has to have the two labeling requirements, neck label and hang tag. <laughs> and the traditional style sleepwear has to have the FPU or GPU number. So when is a sleepwear garment subject to the phthalate requirements or limits? The answer is um, size for children three and under. Mary spoke about this when she talked about the CPSIA requirements. If your tight fitting children's sleepwear garments are sold directly to consumers, I can't read. Find it. <laughs> Okay, if your tight-fitting children's sleepwear garments are sold directly to consumers in a properly labeled package, do they also require a hang tag? The answer is no, they do not require the yellow hang tag if the bag is properly labeled. Now, speaking at a retailer standpoint, if you are selling your tight-fitting garments, um, I know some stores have them actually stacked, and consumers can just go and grab, like fast retailer. Um, that is not required to have a hang tag, since you will be placing the actual hang tag wording in the same coloring on the actual package. That is fine. Are certain fabrics composed of specific fibers exempt from testing requirements for children's sleepwear? Uh, 
Uh, no, there was no specific uh, fiber exemption um, for children's sleepwear. Is there a hang tag requirement that states a garment is flame resistant or flame retardant? Uh, no, there is no hang tag that you need that states that the garment is flame resistant or flame retardant. Which item below would be defined as trim under the standards and requires testing? Great question. <laughs> Everyone's thinking. <laughs> The answer is screen print. All the other trim tights are considered functional trim and do not need to be tested. Would a sleepwear garment size 6 to 12 months require testing under the sleepwear standard? Uh, the answer is yes, it would still need to be required since the sizing goes over the nine month um, limit for infant garments. Can tight fitting sleepwear garments be offered exclusively in small, medium, and large sizes? Uh, no, uh, they need to have additional sizing numbers um, in addition to small, medium, and large sizes. Yes, compliance staff advises that numerical numbers be used as specific, as specified in the tight-fitting garments chart within the standards. When and if there is a size range on the garment, compliance staff will only measure the garment to the smaller size that you label. Do tight-fitting children's sleepwear garments require measurement by a CPSC accepted accredited third-party laboratory? Uh, no, they do not need to be um, tested or measured by an accredited third-party laboratory. For those who answered yes, you will be learning today how to do it on your own. <laughs> okay. All right. That's all the yep. That's all the questions we have. Okay. Good morning. We're ready to resume and get back on track for our agenda. Uh, good morning. I'm Allison Tenney. I've been at the commission for almost 17 years. My current position is division director in the directorate for engineer or for laboratory sciences. Um, I have a couple of my staff here today, so I do want to thank them for all the support. Um, but we're going to start our session with the regulation requirements and testing. I'm going to introduce Linda Fanzler. She's going to moderate this session. She's a senior textile technologist in the Division of Engineering and the Directorate for Laboratory Sciences. Um, she is part of my staff. And she's been with the commission for 31 years. She's a recognized expert in textile flammability and the regulations under the Flammable Fabrics Act. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Linda Fanzler. Good morning. So we're talk going to be talking about the testing requirements. So as everyone, I'm sure, knows by now, there are two mandatory sleepwear standards for children. And they're broken into two size ranges, the smaller size, 0 to 6X, and the larger size, 
7 to 14. And the uh, standards were developed by NIST in the early 70s to protect children from small flame sources. So as I said, the intent is to protect children. We want to reduce the risk of injury uh, or potential death from contact from small flame ignition sources. Small flames would be like matches, candles, and lighters. These standards are not intended to protect against large flame fires, such as a whole house fire. Uh, we found that the test method is a very good predictor of the flammability performance of a garment. Passing specimens will self-extinguish. We found that many polyester fabrics will self-extinguish and meet the requirements, flammability requirements. Cotton and cotton blends do not, I'll repeat, do not meet the flammability requirements of the children's sleepwear standards unless they are treated with a chemical treatment. The standards have been amended periodically over the years. Uh, some of the amendments include sampling plans, the elimination of the re residual flame time, how we test trim in a horizontal direction, the laundering procedures to include an updated of the standard detergent, to uh, then also the tight fitting and the infant garments. And we've talked a little bit about those two already today. I'll just briefly go over those again. So tight-fitting garments are exempt from the children's sleepwear standards in sizes larger than nine months up to size 14. The garments cannot exceed maximum dimensions specified for each size, and you can see the chart right in the standards. There's the labeling rule, which we've talked about, the hang tag, and the permanent label on the garment. And the infant garments are sized nine months or smaller. Although these are exempt from the children's sleepwear requirements, they, re they must meet the flammability requirements found in the general clothing textile standard. That's 16 CFR part 1610. And now we're going to show a very short video. And keep in mind that our, at our lab, when we do the testing, we do a compliance test that is more similar to a garment production test. We get actual garments in to test. Hi, my name is Linda Fansler. I've worked at the Commission for 31 years, the last 21 in the Product Safety Laboratory. Right now, I'm performing a children's sleepwear compliance test. When we receive official samples of children's sleepwear, we test them according to the standards for the flammability of children's sleepwear found at 16 CFR Part 1615 and 1616. These regulations help protect children from potential burn injuries. Unfortunately, we frequently find violations. Most of the time, we already know that the suspect fabrics will burn rapidly and should not be used to make children's sleepwear garments. Oftentimes, they're untreated cotton. We know from experience these fabrics will not pass our regulation. However, we still see them in children's sleepwear products on the market. Now I will show a portion of the testing procedure required for children's sleepwear. Once the garments are received, we evaluate the fabric and seams. We use templates similar to this to prepare the proper specimen size for testing. In this example, we'll be evaluating a garment, fabric, and seam. It is important that the sewing thread used to sew the garment seams is also flame resistant and is not coated with a flammable lubricant sometimes used in the sewing process. We mount the specimen in the holder so that the flame can be applied to the seam first. We anchor the fabric so it lays flat and we use clips to assemble the specimen holder. Once the specimens are mounted in the test frames, the test specimens go into the oven at 105 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes. 
they are removed after 30 minutes and go into our desiccators for another 30 minutes to cool down. After conditioning the specimens according to the test protocol, the specimen is placed in the test cabinet. I will remove the specimen from the desiccator and show you an example of a flame resistant cotton fabric and how a compliant specimen performs. The holder is suspended in the cabinet and the flame will be applied from the side and directed to the bottom edge of the specimen for three seconds. As you can see, nothing happened. That's because this was not a regular piece of cotton fabric. This fabric is flame resistant, which causes the flames to self extinguish or go out once the flame from the test chamber is removed. An untreated cotton fabric would have burned the entire length of the specimen. To illustrate the difference between regular and flame resistant cotton fabric, I'll show you a specimen that is 100% cotton. Again, the specimen is placed in the test apparatus and the flame is applied for three seconds. You can see that once the flame is removed, the specimen continues to burn with large flames. Additionally, once the flames go out, none of the specimen remains. A garment made of this fabric would burn readily when <coughs> exposed to an open flame. A child would not necessarily have the time to react to prevent injuries. Here at the CPSC, we take our job seriously, and we know that you are a partner that shares our commitment to safety. We want to give you the tools to deliver safe products in the marketplace. Thank you. So that was just a very quick summary of how we tested the lab. And Carrie, I believe, is going to come up. And, or, sorry, Paige is going to talk about tight fitting. Testing. Oh, testing. I'm sorry. All right, I'm here to talk about, um, go into a little more detail about the specifics of testing that we do. Um, here's a brief overview of what we consider sleepwear once again, um, nightgowns, pajamas, robes, loungewear, we all consider sleepwear and will be tested. Um, once again, the sizes are there. Um, for, uh, for the test method, we typically do the fabric seams, trim, and of the final gar, or, sorry, this is for you guys. You need to test the fabric, seams, and trim, and the final garment um, to get your FPUs and GPUs as well as prototypes for seams and trims. Um, each test sample that you do must consist of five specimens. Um, the testing must be done in original state and after 50 launderings um, if the sample passes in the original state. Um, and the test, sample, test samples are required to be retained once again for your rec record keeping. Um, so the first thing we're going to talk about is the uh, fabric production unit. Um, this thing is up to 5,000 linear yards of finished fabric um, for normal sampling. There are other types of sampling plans, is uh, reduced and tightened. Um, we won't go into much detail about those, but those are available for various testing plans. Um, finished fabric is considered dyed. Any finishes are applied. That is the finished fabric, except for slicing. Um, typically, you do not want to test an undyed fabric and then dye it later because it can definitely change the flammability properties of that fabric. Different colors and prints can be combined in an FPU, but they you can only do different colors or different prints. You cannot have both uh, different colors and prints within the FP, same FPU. Um, samples need to be taken at the beginning and the end of the FPU, so within that 5,000 linear yards, you need to take samples from the beginning of end of that 5,000 yards. Um, to include different um, colors or different patterns, te additional testing needs to be done to show that they show similar testing or uh, flammability properties um, and that the char length are not significantly different. Um, all initial FPUs, um, are done in the finished state and, once again, original state and after laundering. Um, if the FPU has not been tested to 50 launderings, the GPU must be tested to 50 launderings. If you do, yep. Can I ask a question yeah. Here? 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And not chose to or just the original. Um, I believe that um when you may know that it's a little more detailed. So the question is whether you test could you could you repeat that? Sure. And, and could you hold it for a second? Can Jonathan give you the? Thank you. Okay. If I if I am trying to combine three different colorways, so I have red, blue, and green, and basically I can combine them if three samples from each of the colors have been tested and don't show significantly different char lengths. So when I'm testing the red and then I'm going to test the blue and then I'm going to test the green and I'm testing three samples of each. Is that correct? Yes. yes. Okay. So for those, for the first sample of those three samples for a specific color, do I need to do both original and after 50 launderings for only the first of the three samples of each color or for all three samples of each color? I'm going to let Mary take that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what you're doing with the three samples is you're identifying whether or not they have different char lengths, whether or not they have similar flammability characteristics. So once you establish that, then the 50 launderings can be done on one of those three colors, and it'll be equivalent for all three colors. You just have to know what you're doing. You know, you have to know what you're doing. You have to know that the samples that you're testing are, have similar or identical right, you know, right. characteristics. Yeah. So then you're good for the 50 launderings after you make that assessment that they're the same. Then you can do the 50 launderings and that'll apply to the other two colors and you can combine them in an FPU. Okay. Okay. I am going to add that this is just speaking about knits. You can't construct, you can't add different construction mixes because I see a lot of confused faces. Right, right. And we are going to have a testing panel and Luann gets in depth on GPU and FPU testing. Just for one quick clarification, it was three specimens and not three samples, correct? Three samples, five specimens of each sample. So 15 sp specimens per color. Is that true, Mary? It's three specimens, right? No, three, three, spe three, three samples. Are three samples. So I <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I, I just want to be sure we're all clear because I know there's a lot of information yeah. going around. So I have the same fabrication and I'm making it in red, blue, and green. And so I'm going to test three samples, 15 specimens, mm -hmm. of the red and in the original. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to do the same thing for the blue and the same thing for the green. Yes. And then I'm going to go back to the red and I'm going to launder it 50 times. And I'm going to test three samples. Yeah, it tests the same ones that yeah. I did mm -hmm. from the same fabrics. Yeah. And if it passes the 50 launderings, then I can make the assumption that the blue and the green will pass 50 launderings because it's basically the same fabrication. Yes. Yes. And then I can, in subsequent FPUs, I can combine all three colors, the production amount of all three colors into one FPU. Yes. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Great. Yep. Yeah, I mean, yep. you still have to follow the FPU numbers yes. and, yeah. and everything yeah. else, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Good question. Yep. Okay, so now we're going to move on to prototyping. This is done um, pre-production. It's done on the seams and the trim of your garment or your future garment. Um, each seam should be tested and evaluated, um, which leads, you can lead, or you have to do each construction. So it can lead to a num numerous amount of different seam types and constructions as well as tim trim types in their construction. Um, the prototype must be um, the same as the orientation that it's going to be on the garment, so either vertical or horizontal. Um, functional trim is exempted, so that was some of the things that we mentioned in the questions. Uh, spaghetti straps are considered functional, zippers are considered functional, um, small decals are, con are not considered um, trim that needs to be tested. 
Um, Any time you consider a change or you're going to make a change in the garment design, you need to do a new prototype testing for that. Um, so now the garment production unit, the GPU, is um, finished garment up to 500 dozen or 6,000 units that have specific identity um, and it remains unchanged uh, throughout the unit except for size, trim, findings, um, and print patterns. Um, the production testing performed on the GPU is done on seams only. Um, different solid colors or different print patterns on the same fabric may be included in the same GPU as long as three or more samples from each solid color or print pattern are tested similar to the FPU. Um, you cannot combine solid colors and print patterns and you cannot combine knits and wovens in the same GPU. This is also similar where you can't combine, they're both knits but maybe one's a fleece and one's a plain knit or a plain knit. Um, so that is the same, they cannot be combined in the same GPU. Um, samples need to be taken randomly from the GPU population. Typically, you need at least five samples for testing. Fifteen specimens are needed and separated into three sample sets. No more than five can be taken from a single garment. All specimens from a single garment must be included in the same sample set. So you can't have five from one and then like an extra six from the same garment that you put into a different sample set. Um, so these are for rejected products. An FPU or prototype that fails needs to be reworked to improve the flammability performances. After a rework is done on the FPU, you would go to the tightened uh, sampling plan that I mentioned earlier. These can all be found um, in the regulation and also in your test manuals. Um, after a rework is done on a prototype that had failed, it has to be retested. A failing or a rejected GPU that has been offered for sale must be reported under Section 15 that we mentioned earlier. If the product cannot be reworked, it needs to be um, rejected and marked that it did not pass um, the standards and records must be kept and must be properly marked that it does not pass our standards. Now we're going to go into some of the um, more nitty gritty of the test method. So here's kind of an overview, um, the size of the specimen, they need to be conditioned. Each specimen is placed in a medical or bleh, a vertical metal holder. Um, the gas flame must be three centimeters, and the char length must be measured at the end after after glow and flame has finished. Um, here are examples of our weight, and the fabric weight must be measured beforehand to know the type of weight you need to use to test the char length at the end of testing. Um, Cutting, the sample size is about three and a half inches by ten inches. You need to take samples from both the warp and filling direction or vertical and horizontal um, for the test. Um, samples are mounted. The bottom edge must be um, in line with the edge of the metal holder so it um, hits the flame at the right height. The size of the specimen must be clamped. And here are the conditioning requirements that I mentioned, 105 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes and place in the desiccator to cool for no less than 30 minutes, but it cannot exceed 60 minutes. Um, in your test cabinet, you'll have a marker to indicate the flame height and the flame, you just need to make sure that the flame is consistent and remains at 3.8 centimeters. Um, so the samples are removed from the desiccator after the 30 minutes and suspended vertically in the test cabinet. Flame is applied for three seconds to the bottom edge of the fabric. And if you have seams, the seam edge must be facing the inside or towards the flame. Once the specimen is, has burned to completion, um, remove it. You will use the weight that you, um, from the fabric weight that you calculated earlier, um, and hook the weight onto one edge of the fabric and tear it to get the full char length. And then you will measure from that edge to the bottom edge of your um, specimen. There's a picture of measuring from the bottom edge of the fabric to the top of the char length. Uh, the average char length of the five specimens cannot exceed 17 centimeters or 7 inches and no individual specimen can it have a full length burn, which is 10 inches. Um, here is um, our 
laundering requirements. They are also found in our test manual and in the regulation. Um, and now I will turn it over to Carrie to go over a little bit more of what is sleepwear. Okay, so now we're going to speak on how the Office of Compliance evaluates and determines children's sleepwear garments. And if everyone wants to take out their lab manual, we're going to actually go over the tight-fitting garments, and you can actually walk step through step with me. There's a little bit more information on here, and everything's going to fit on the PowerPoint slide. All right, so as stated previously during the interactive questions, um, there are no fiber exemptions under the children's sleepwear standard. However, we do have the following exemptions. Diapers and underwear are not considered sleepwear. They have to be, um, they have to comply with 1610, which is the general wearing apparel. Infant garments are also exempt from the sleepwear standard for flammability, um, as long as they are sized nine months and under. There's also a um, length requirement, so if those are exceeded, either a one piece or a two piece, there is an actual factor that they could actually be considered to be sleepwear. Um, tight fitting garments are also do not need to meet the flammability requirements unless they do not actually meet the tight fitting specifications. If they do not meet the tight fitting measurements, then they will be tested to flammability and they will fail because most of the time they're 100% cotton. The CPSC staff considers several factors when determining whether a garment is sleepwear and does not com and does not con only sorry and does not only consider the manufacturer's marking, marketing terms and designations. Factors include the nature of the garment and its suitability for sleeping or active related to sleeping or activities related, and the type of fabric, decorative features, and print patterns that are used. How the garment will be purchased and used by children for sleeping and activities related, which also brings us to the category of loungewear. In the 1990s, a category of products called loungewear was introduced into the children's market. The CPSC staff views children's loungewear or other similar garments marketed as comfort wear, or sometimes the new word is playwear, um, as garments worn primarily for sleep-related activities. Therefore, loungewear must comply with the children's sleepwear standards. A letter of guidance, which Mary did mention, um, was sent to the industry in, I believe, 1996. It was sent out again in 2008, and I recently sent it out again in 2015, February. So the document is called the Sleepwear Policy and Loungewear Position Letter. If you need it, you can email me, and I will send it directly to you. So here pictured, we have traditional sleepwear garments. We have seen loungewear, which are the first two, top and bottom, the pant sets. These are usually actually sold solo, um, usually called playwear or loungewear. The middle pink garment is a two-piece set that was actually sold as tight-fitting. However, as I stated, if it exceeds the measurement dimensions, it is going to be placed into the traditional sleepwear category. And the other two garments were sized 6 to 12 months and 9 to 24 months. And that is why those two were also considered sleepwear. Here we have some recent sleepwear that has been recalled. We have two robes, um, the loungewear boxers, two piece sets that were not within the limits for tight fitting measurements, and also a garment that failed trim on that screen print on the dark navy outfit. So to summarize what exactly is required for children's sleepwear garments, children's sleepwear garments must meet the flammability requirements and also the or and or the tight fitting. A CPC like Mary said, a children's product certificate is required for all children's products. This includes every single garment of sleepwear. Um, the lead content, lead surface coating, and tracking labels are all also um, required under the CPSIA and also the phthalate requirements. So 
But with that summary, we do have some time for additional questions if anyone has any. Was it going to be labeled? Which one? Well, you could take them A and B. So if a okay. row is labeled bathrobe or in a catalog is featured, shown as a child is next to a bathtub. Sleepwear. Is, yeah, is it sleepwear? That's lounging. It's related. Got take it. a bath, you go to bed. That is going to be under the category loungewear, sleepwear. Traditional sleepwear. Got Correct. it. Correct. Swimsuit cover-ups are a little trickier, perhaps, if they're shown with a child wearing a swimsuit next to a pool. They're or allowed. We're just having a, an issue with the actual designers. You know, there is a cervical to knee measurement that is required to be met if you're going to make spa cover-ups or beach, pool, whatever you want to call them. They need to meet the cervical to knee measurement, and I will be bringing that up in the oh, tight okay, fitting great. guidelines. Um, but yeah, they have to be above the knee, right. way above so the knee. So that if they exceed the correct length to consider them pool they, or spa, it's a measuring issue. It's a measuring, and also that's just one aspect, like marketing, distribution, your merchandising. If you're going to put it next to the robes that kids are going to be using for bath time, I'm going to take that into consideration. Okay, good. Clear. A lot of aspects. Yes. Hi. I'm Cindy. Hi. Here. Hi. Hi I'm Cindy from H&M. I have a question about long johns. I mean, you would think of them as underwear, but if they meet the tight fitting measurements, like it would be like a a long pajama bottom, it could be a separate pajama bottom. If they were labeled with the yellow hang tag, would, could they be sold as pajamas if they meet the tight fitting measurements for a pajama bottom? Or if they don't, and they're considered by CPSC as underwear, do you label them something like not to be used as sleepwear? How do you treat those? How do you look at those? Okay, long johns, everyone calls them what, long johns or union suits? Something like, yeah. Yeah, they're considered to be underwear. We do see them as underwear. Until you put that tag that says not considered to be sleepwear, that's, that's a red flag to CPSC staff. We advise that you do not use those. Don't use those. We advise against that, yes. Because when you're putting a tag on a garment, you're going to make the consumer think, oh, well, maybe I can use it for sleepwear. You know, that's how the commission sees it. And the fabric is printed with little sleeping bunnies. The, does that change whether it's underwear or sleepwear? Depends on how you're going to market it. Where are you going to place it in your store? How are you going to merchandise it? If I put it with all the other long johns? If you have a, an actual long john category, then that's an underwear area, right? Yes. Then it's still considered underwear. It'd still be considered daywear, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, could you elaborate a little bit more on what you consider to be a multi-layer fabric? And um, if it's something that is attached all the way through and then you test it as one piece, or um, would, it, would a multi-layer fabric be something that, um, say you have a gown that there's an attachment, everything's attached to the waist, but there's two pieces that free flow at the bottom. Do you test that as a multi-layer fabric, or are those two separate fabrics? We, we test them if they're free flowing as two separate fabrics. Even though they're attached at the, at the waist. Okay. Thank you. Um, I just want to clarify what you said. If something is thermal underwear, we should not be putting something on there that says do not use for, s not intended for sleep. Correct. The same thing with a beach robe, we shouldn't do that either. Not Correct. Okay. Thanks. I think it's a very simple question. Um, when you're testing 
screen printing. How do you do that? Just according to the regular trim, you cut it out. Like if it's on the f fabric and it's been screen printed, you cut it out and sample it. I'm not familiar with the testing for screen printing as trim. Linda or Paige? Um, yeah, we would take the um, the guy or the layout and we would put it over the screen print and cut it out and make sure that the bottom edge, the flame would impinge on that screen print. And then I guess a follow up would be if, of course, the screen print was less than two inches and narrow, would you then? not test it under the narrow fabric exemption for, for trim? Yeah, if it's under the two inch, um, if it covers less than the two inches, then it would not need to be tested. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Carolyn, can you um, please elaborate on accessories that may be sold with sleepwear? And Such as slippers, sli sleep masks, things like that. Correct. Tutus, capes. Tutus? Capes. With sleepwear? Very often. We've seen some combinations sold as combination sets. Yes. Tutus? Um, <laughs> tutu, that is an actual garment. I don't find that to be an accessory. You're actually wearing that. Um, so if it's going to be like sold. Little net tutu that they sell with the sleepwear to put on over it. Because it becomes sold as a set. I have not seen those. I mean, usually we advise that anything sold with sleepwear should be able to meet the flammability requirements. A tutu to me still, you're wearing it. I don't find that to be an accessory. It's actually around your waist. It's not like a slipper. Um, so I would say that that should meet the flammability requirements. What about a Wait, hat? Excuse me. Which um, flammability requirement? Well, it can't be tight fitting. It's more than one fourth of a trim. It would definitely be flammability. So it would be the 1615, 1616 test as opposed to 1610? Correct. Okay. And you said hats? Such as like newborn hats, like hats with the layout sets, the uh, stuff like that? That's an accessory. Anything else? All the way in the back. Um, I just wanted to go back to Ellen's question about sleep masks. Would that also be considered an accessory? That's an accessory. Okay, so we wouldn't have to meet any testing requirements with that. It's actually, 1610 sleep masks okay. are under 1610. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Want to go to lunch or you want to go right into tight fitting? Oh. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So, you need those lab manuals for sure. So, now we're going to get into tight fitting sleepwear specifically. So, tight fitting garments are exempt from testing to the sleepwear requirements under flammability. They do need to meet, obviously, the tight fitting specifications. There is a size chart in every CFR. You can also email me and I will send you a chart. And if Doug is so nice, he can give you a little index card. So here we have actual garments that are tight fitting. Tight fitting garments can be shorts. They can be short sleeves. They can be a mix. You can have any type of long sleeve or short or pant cross. I mean, they can all mix match. Here we have some recall tight fitting sleepwear. These were all recalled due to um, multiple exceeding amounts of measurements. Like the like we usually say, there are there's a minimum tolerance within the tight fi fitting measurements, but we usually really look at the wrist, upper arm, and the top's waist. P places where there's points of buyer access, and it's usually around the child's arm, their waist. And these also had labeling issues, and they also had sleepwear policy issues. The tight-fitting garments require two types of labeling. 
They require a neck label and a hang tag label. And for those garments, as I said, those sold in packages have to have a warning label on the outside of the package. This goes in depth of what the actual neck labels can look like, should look like, sorry. So the neck label must be at least five points in font. We even pick out the font for you. When it has to be in all capital letters, it needs to be directly under the size limit. And the hang tag has its specific font and size as well. It also needs to have that black box. This catches the consumer's eye. Now if you, ooh, sorry. Now if you want to turn to page, I believe it's 51 in the lab book. This is where we start. And we're going to start with measuring the chest. So before you start measuring your garment, you need to have a flat surface. You also need to make sure that you are making the garment smooth, but you don't want to, you know, when you put down the garment, you don't want to stretch it out. You're not going to help your case by stretching out the garment before you measure it. It needs to be in a relaxed state. So the chest measurement is taken from armpit seam to armpit seam. And if the seams are being raised, you're just going to take whatever measuring tape or ruler you're using, and you're just going to flat seam it down. Measuring the waist of the top is to be taken at the hemline from point C to point D. On a one-piece garment, it can be a little bit tricky, but you need to measure at the most narrow part between the chest and the seat. I usually look around the belly button area. The measuring the upper arm, this is where I see a lot of violations, is the upper arm measurement. I do understand that tight-fitting garments are tight-fitting, but that is the purpose, and you cannot exceed in the upper arm measurement. So for the upper arm measurement, you're going to use a straight edge to form a line from the waist through the armpit to the shoulder of the garment. From this point on the shoulder, you're going to measure down the arm sleeve using the appropriate value for the size of the garment. From this point, <laughs> you're going to measure across the sleeve perpendicular to the top edge of the sleeve. Measuring the wrist or cuff. The wrist measurement is from point E to F, which is in the end, which is the end of the opening. For a short sleeve top, you must use a roller to check if the sleeve is tapering from the top of the shoulder to the end of the opening. I get a lot of questions of what the definition of tapering means. It means the garment's getting smaller. The, you know, the actual opening is going to a close. The pant is to be measured at a relaxed state from side to side at the very top of the pant. Please note that for the tight-fitting garments, you cannot have a trim that exceeds more than one, one fourth of an inch. That means no ribbon, no drawstring, nothing can be present at the elastic, at the elastic, or sorry, elastic waistband. There is no elastic. It cannot be present at the center front of the pant. Does that make sense? The so measuring the seat of the pant or short is to be taken by folding the front of the pant in half. You have to find the bottom of the crotch. So you're going to mark the point above the crotch by four inches exactly. And you're going to do it perpendicular to the bottom of the crotch. Which you see here, I hope you can see J and K. If not, it's in your lap annuals, a little bit darker. And then you're going to measure from the point L through K to M. So it's basically going up and then over and over. That Jet, that L to M is your actual measuring point. That is your data. To measure the thigh, you're going to measure one inch down the inseam from the bottom of the crotch, which is J to N, and you're going to measure from this point across the pant leg, which is N to O. When measuring the ankle, for pants that extend to the ankle, you're going to measure across the width of the end of the pant leg, which here is P to Q. For shorts or capri pants that do not extend to the ankle, the pant leg may not exceed the maximum width for the thigh and must diminish in width gradually as it approaches the ankle. Tapering. 
The tight-fitting garments cannot have any trims, decor, or embellishments that exceed one-fourth of an inch from the point of attachment. This includes lace, appliques, drawstrings, ribbons, um, raised buttons. And here is a picture of a trim being measured. So even those little baby tags or side seam labels that a lot of companies like to put on um, for social media purposes, branding purposes, those have to meet the one fourth inch rule as well. Lettuce edging. We get a lot of questions about lettuce edging, even though I do not see it ever being sold. Um, this edge finish should be measured and scalloped. Um, the scalloped, sorry, the scalloped edges should not extend more than obviously one fourth of an inch. And you can use a stand roller on the end perpendicular to the garment against the scalloped edges. For a two-piece set, a set may consist of a combination of a piece that meets the tight-fitting requirements and a piece that meets the flammability requirements of the children's sleepwear standards. Both pieces must taper to the waist, the top tapers from the chest to the waist, and the bottom tapers from the seat to the waist. For tight-fitting tops, Tops with front fasteners must have the lowest fastener within six inches of the bottom of that piece. For boat neck style tops and envelope shoulders that are not, sorry, boat neck style tops and envelope shoulders are not prohibited as long as the measurements do not exceed those as in the standards. Any questions on tight fitting? Oh. He's coming. <laughs> um, does the CPSC have a preference um, whether we use inches or millimeters no. to measure? I mean, there's both in here, but as long as your preference? garment meets those measurements, that's why we have both available. Usually for um, companies overseas, they have to obviously comply with our standards too, and they don't use inches, so that's why we have it. But no, as long as they meet, and if you're using a lab, if you want to have it in centimeters or inches, that's fine. does not matter. There's no preference. I actually am the lab. You are the lab. There you go. <laughs> All the way in the back, John. Hi, I'm Mike Diablo uh, from SGI. Have you found that the retail community has requested longer lengths on cotton garments because they don't feel that the CPSC garments are long enough? No. Nope. I we have ha not gotten that question. Yeah, we have. Yeah, yeah like top lengths. So kids but, are getting taller. Or they don't feel that the spec is long enough because uh, when they put them on the garments, Maybe the kid is a little bigger, a little smaller, their belly's hanging out, they want them a little longer. So um, I just wanted to know if you've gotten any feedback from that. I have not. Hasn't reached my office yet. <laughs> yeah, I'd be interested, is H&M, do they do anything like that? Cindy. Yeah, we have several retailers that are asking for that now. We have gotten questions on the sizing standards um, that are in the tight fitting requirements. And because the rule was written in 1996, kids' uh, sizes have changed quite a bit. And uh, we've been asked to take a look at the sizing that's in the tight fitting requirements. We don't have a project to do it right now, but um, we are aware that people are asking the question about the tight fitting sizing that's in the standard. One thing that I hear is that wait, wait, wait a second. Wait. <laughs> One thing that I hear is that people are just buying larger sizes. So even though it says buy it to fit snug, that it's intended to be worn small, I know a lot of people just buy it bigger. So that could be also to compensate for the, the length as well. Yeah, and we, you know, we don't recommend that people no, do that. I, I realize that, but yeah. I think that's what's actually <laughs> happening in a lot of yeah. cases. 
There's only so much we can control. Does the CPSC offer any kind of guidance document on how many items should be, for tight-fitting sleepwear, how many items should be measured across a batch size to have confidence that your whole batch is tight-fitting? You mean quality control? Yes. Yeah, I would say, uh, this would be personal because we don't really have, you know, a statement stating that you have to test or measure every four garments we just advise that you're doing quality control purposing. You know, you actually have a team or the factory or you're using a lab and you're, you're making sure. Because we do, I mean, those recalls, that was an issue. They thought, they gave their correct dimensions to the factory. They weren't followed. You know, that comes back on the firm. So, yeah, you do need to have a certain team, someone or, you know, multiple people measuring throughout the entire process. That's the only way you're going to know that they're being followed. Uh, when the rule was first written, we recommended that manufacturers uh, uh, measure at least 10 garments in a size. That, that gave you a pretty good uh, range for the um, tolerance within that size. Is that per style or just? Per, uh, yeah, so that you're still ongoing testing. You mean? Yeah, yeah, each measurement dimension needs to be tested per size. Yes. For the baby sizes, um, where there's um, the exemption up to nine months, when you're measuring um, a baby size, there's that maximum dimension in the length. the length. How would you measure it when there's a foot? It's a footy style. When you get to that foot part, do you, uh, you have to, do you go to the ankle? Do you flatten out that foot? Are there You're any talking about the elastic the seam? Yeah, you yeah. measure the heel. Yeah, when there's a footy, when it's a footy style, mm -hmm. th that maximum length, how do you, how you're do you You're not measure measuring it? it to the toe, if that's what, you, what you're asking. You're going to measure it at the ankle. Measure to the ankle. To the heel. To, to the, the heel of the, the heel. foot. Yeah. Okay, so you flip it over, you measure it on the back, and you measure to the heel. Okay, so the, the heel and the ankle is, it might be a different seam, though. Yeah, that's, there's either elastic or there's an actual seam. Right. So okay. if you're doing it to the heel, the right. ankle would be the elastic seam. Does that okay. make sense? Um, yeah, well, I mean, it might be different per style, like you're saying. Yes. Okay. You can, you can always send me a picture, so you can give me All right, one. okay, that would be great. Thank yeah. you. Hungry now. <laughs> okay, just a thank you to the panel. Thank you to Carolyn Carlin, Paige Whitson, and Linda Fansler for the very informative session on testing, tight fitting, and the laboratory requirements. Also, want to thank Jonathan Kent for fielding the questions and. Uh, taking in questions. If you do need to send in questions by email, it is jkent, J-K-E-N-T at cpsc.gov. So we will look at those later at the Q&A session. So we will get back on track. We will go to lunch and return at 1 o'clock p.m. sharp. But because we have covered some afternoon sessions, that does mean that we will conclude our seminar a little bit earlier than expected. So hopefully that makes everyone happy. Um, there's some, there's a lunch place here in the building. There's a shuttle van outside of the building that makes a loop around Bethesda and goes to Bethesda Row. Uh, there's the website on the handout that was in your folder with some other restaurant ideas and places uh, close by in Bethesda. It's also walkable. It's, it's a decent walk, but it's certainly doable. Please feel free to ask any CPSC staff if you want some recommendations or ideas or directions. Um, we have a couple exciting sessions coming up this afternoon, so I don't want you to miss those. So 1 p.m. sharp, we will have our panel on testing. We have representatives from independent laboratories here to share their stories with you. And we also have what to expect when you're inspected with some other CPSC staff. And then we will field any questions and answers 
to ensure that you have your chance to ask questions and learn something new from today's seminar. So have a great lunch. I will see everyone at 1 p.m. Thanks.